I want you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. I just want to share for a little while where our time has gone. Now, don't forget today is Mission Sunday and Rosie and her team, Rosie and Ron, are in the kitchen um, cooking up a storm. I think there's um, going to be salad rolls. Actually, you don't cook salad rolls, but they're making a storm. Oh, that doesn't sound right. But they're in the kitchen making food for us, so that's for afterwards. Philippians chapter 4, and I just want to read a, a short scripture out of there, verse 8, and it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there any, is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you learnt and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. This is a powerful uh, scripture. In fact, the very, very first sermon I ever preached was out of this particular scripture. It was back in probably 1981 when I just be became a Christian and I got invited along to a leadership training se seminar at, uh, at Richmond Church where I was and I didn't know any, anything really, but, I, but they selected me to share a, a message amongst a group of leaders and God just gave me this message about, you know, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is right. And, you know, friends, it's so true that whatever you spend your energy on is what will concentrate your life. If you spend your energy on good things, on healthy things, on things that will build you up, then you become a good and a decent person. Who knows that? You know, prior to being a Christian, I spent so much of my energy on negative stuff. You know, I would hang around. Because of my background, I had a kind of a druggy kind of background and kind of a party guy. And, and so I was always about, you know, getting involved in, in all the wrong stuff. And you know how people tend to buy into buy into gossip and buy into arguments and stuff. Who, who, who knows that? I, I call it the, um, you know, the, like the, this mentality that, that comes out of, out of Peyton Place. Actually, you probably don't remember that, but it's a, it was a soap opera. But it's like soap opera thinking, you know, where we, everybody's having a crisis and everybody knows everyone's business and we all talk about everybody behind everyone's back and, you know, it's kind of this unhealthy environment. And one of the things that transpired in my heart when I first met Jesus is, you know, I, I went from, from com real darkness. I was in complete darkness and Jesus got a hold of me and brought me into this amazing light. And, you know, for me, I just wanted so much to bathe myself in, in the Word of God and in the, in the things of God. And not long after, in fact, a couple of days after I got saved, I got a job at the standard newspapers in Cheltenham. I, I used to be a layout artist, a, a design artist for newspapers then. I went into that place and the very first thing I did is I took my Bible and this dirty great big Bible I had actually and I laid it on the desk. Hadn't read it yet, really, but didn't matter. I was kind of making a point because I'd always been the guy in the, in the every shit job I'd had of the fun guy, you know, the guy that would always be in trouble and always tell bad jokes and you know what I mean, that guy. And, and I wanted so much to be the other guy. I wanted to be someone that was decent and, you know, God gave me this incredible opportunity to be that. And, uh, you know, the rest's history. Here I am all these years later, um, 1980 to 2014 is 30, 2015, 35 years. It's a long time. But, you know, God can transform the worst life. I love that. I love that he can take the most broken and he can give them a new start. And you might think, you know, I'm too far gone or my brain's too far fried. You know, I believe God can take anybody who can change them. And I love that. You know, it's really interesting to me. The wo these words were penned by Paul. And Paul was a, a self-righteous Jew. And um, he'd grown up as a Pharisee. He'd learnt the scriptures all his life. But he was so full of rage at the, at the Christians that he went, to, he went to try and kill the Christians. But here he was some years later penning this, this book to the church in, in Philippi. And he wrote these wonderful words. But he said something very significant here. The things that you've learnt and received and heard and seen, seen in me, 
practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. The things that you've seen in me, what a, what a boast that is. The things that you've seen in me. Wow. That's kind of saying, you know, I am an example of this thing. I often used to say, you know, if you were gonna, if you were gonna sell hair restorer, you wouldn't buy it from me, because <sighs> you'd think, hey, it doesn't work. What? And I'd say, yeah, no, no, it does. I said, but you've, you're bald, and I, and that's the trouble with a lot of our Christianity. People don't want it because of the life we live. And I heard someone say something one day, you know. I can't hear him because his life is screaming too loud. And it's often true that the very thing that we live, the very example that we are, is not the example that Christ gives us in the Scriptures. And you know, one of the, um, one of the things that we've discovered about Myanmar, about Burma, is that the example that the, that the young people are given in that nation is just wrong. In fact, religion has so perverted the church in that nation that it's so true that people grow up in the church and they don't have a true picture of what being a Christian is. They have a kind of a picture that, yeah, Jesus is nice, he's kind of there, but he's actually interested in you being successful because you get money. And what tends to happen, it's such an impoverished and poor country that pastors there that might have started out okay, but money got into their hearts somewhere. And that money has polluted their message so much so that now they're no longer preaching the true gospel that they once, once got a hold of. And you know, friends, it's so true that the picture that we paint for others, the life we live for others, is such a big deal for God. I really believe that. You know, I met a, um, a pastor over in Myanmar. Actually, he came to our, our graduation and he, he turned out, I didn't know him when I met him, but it turned out he'd been, he, he was in charge of an orphanage in, in Myanmar and he had like a hundred kids. And, you know, in my brain, I think, wow, this guy cares for kids. He's really a good guy. And, and I, I kind of liked him and and after, after he, I actually got him to translate for, I had to do a dedication of, of All Rain and Connor's new baby, Grace, and I dedicated them at the graduation. And, and I got him to translate because All Rain normally translates for me. And anyway, afterwards, I was talking to All Rain and he was telling me about this guy. And, you know, he grew up with him as kind of a father in this, in this church he had in, in Myanmar. But this guy would now come to visit all these kids that have been part of his orphanage and he'd asked them for money. Actually came to, to All Rain and actually asked him to give him money. He went to All Rain's sister, got money off her. and He was corrupt, absolutely corrupt. And yet he, he dared to call himself a Christian. In fact, I, had, I said to All Rain, you're really lucky you didn't tell me that when I met him because I would, I, something in me gets really, really rife about this. I would have said, brother, how dare you call yourself a pastor? Because of the things he, do, he does for others. And we've learnt over the years in Myanmar, not all is as it seems. Not all that say one thing actually do the, do the same thing. Who's, who's learnt that in life about pastors and about churches? I've learnt that all is as it seems in the church. And you know, I want to say to you this morning, my longing is to be the real deal. I want to be the real deal. I want to, the things I say from this pulpit is the things I live in my life. That's such a big deal for me. But it's not always a big deal for everyone else. Some people are more interested in how it seems to other people. And often we've got a, a, a Christianity that's based in performance. And as long as you do the thing up in front of people and you preach well or you say things a certain way, it doesn't actually matter how you live. And I found that that is so rife. It's, it's rife not only in Myanmar, but it's rife even in nations like Australia. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, and I need to move along because time, time, but Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talked about the, 
the Beatitudes. In fact, it was chapter 6 and 5, but he talked about the Beatitudes. And at the end of the Beatitudes, he said this really powerful word, and everyone who hears these words of mine who does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, the, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What he's saying here is the foundations on which you build are so very important. You could build the most beautiful house and if you built that house upon the sand, when the rains come, and this scripture doesn't say if, it actually says when. And there's no doubt in my, in my mind that every one of us will go through storms in our walk with God. You'll go through times where you're challenged, or you'll go through times where you think God is not with you, where you feel alone. But those are the times when your foundations matter the most. When what you've built your house upon will stand for you in those times. And I, I really believe, friends, that foundations are everything in our walk with God. You know, one of, the, one of the major things that we need to face is being healed up from the issues of our past, the issues that, that have constrained us and even given us significantly bad pictures about, about the things of faith, dealing with our stuff. You know, one of the things you've heard from this pulpit a number of times is the whole deal about father issues or the father heart of God and You've heard me say this, but I didn't really have a relationship with my dad. My parents divorced when I was 10 years old. I didn't really know him. He was an alcoholic. He, 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 you know, for the last number of years when he was living at home, he wasn't there. He wasn't present because alcohol was pretty much the only thing that mattered to him. And so for, for me as a young, young man, I really didn't have an example of a, of a godly father or even a good father or even a bad father. I just didn't have an example. And I grew up as a teenager not having an example, really. And, and that was part of the reason that I chose the road I chose, looking for who am I, where do I fit, where do I belong? You know, an orphan might seem good until you touch that place in their heart. And, you know, it's so interesting if you, you meet people and you think, wow, they're so well adjusted and so, so well developed in, in their life. And yet you find an area that is kind of like a sore point, kind of like an area that's not yet healed up. And I believe it's so important that we face the very areas that God, uh, that are weak or broken in our hearts. Because if you spend your life living this faith life and every time you get faced with an area that is of weakness or is an area of brokenness, that thing will, will cause you to fall. And, you know, um, it's interesting. I was reading an article this week. And in fact, I found this. I'll show you this particular article out of the newspaper. It's actually out of an American newspaper. And the... Um, you know, this whole homosexual debate's pretty big over there right now. And, and these, these four young children, or these, sorry, four adult children from homosexuals that have grown up in homosexual families have actually came out and they've said, you know, they've gone to court and they've st stood up in court and they've said, you know, whilst the homosexual community actually want, wants you to believe that growing up in a homosexual family is actually healthy, there's nothing wrong with it, we four want to show you a different picture and it's kind of interesting and I haven't got time to read it through but one of them says I grew up with a parent and her partners in an atmosphere in which gay ideology was used as a tool of repression retribution and abuse she says of a lesbian mother and a series of living lovers I've seen that children in gay households often become props to be publicly displayed to prove that gay families are just like heterosexual families and it goes on and each one of them talks about their story. And, you know, the problem is, friends, you will hear in the public, in the press, is this is actually normal, it's actually okay. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about homosexuality here. I'm talking about whatever is the example we have. And, you know, for me, at least, I grew up without a dad. And I want to say that was a, an area that God's had to deal with me. He's had to help me to process in my own 
life. And you know, when I met Jesus, I fell in love. I fell so much in love with him. He became everything to me, but he had to start to teach me about the whole area of discipline, the whole area of of what a father is like in, in, in my life. And, you know, I really have learned, I believe, that God is trustworthy. And, you know, one of the problems with much of the church and many of us in the church is we've inherited a picture of God that is based around a religious ideology. You know, the problem with religion is actually presents God in a way that isn't really true. That God is actually angry with us some of the time and he's actually disapproving of our choices and he's actually quite upset with us most of the time. And it's kind of like we've got to find out how do we kind of get this thing right so God isn't upset with us. Who knows what I'm talking about? And you know, I want to say that religion is not a good foundation. You know, it's interesting, there was a man called David Berg who started an organisation called the Children of God in, a, in America. They were, became a very big sect in the 1970s. In fact, David Berg said, or he believed that he was responsible for the Jesus people outpouring. He wasn't, but he was a significant sect in that group. They became known as the Children of God. And what would happen in this Children of God is people would give their hearts to Jesus and they would have this real encounter with God. But then David Berg would say to the girls, you need to go now and get young men and sleep with them so that you can bring them into the children of God sect. And they used to call it flirty fishing because that was taught as part of their doctrine. Now you and I in this room think, well, that's really stupid. But guess what? It produced a whole generation of really messed up people who thought that that's what God required of them. Now, I have learned that if you get someone that has been brought up in a sect or a cult or even, even a, a far left or far right church, it's so hard to undo some of the principles that, that has been put in their heart. I've tried to work with people that have come up in, in these kind of organisations and frankly, it's so difficult because their foundations are based in error. You know, um, in, one, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. And if ever there's a person that says, you need to come and follow me, submit to me, then you need to run a mile. You know, I believe in submission. I believe that God wants us to learn submission and submitting to him and submitting to each other. But when a church or an organization puts you in a place where you must do what they tell you to do, that's not what the Bible says. You know, many people spend their lives trying to be good enough for God. But I want to say to you right now, you'll never be good enough for God because you already are. He loves you. He thinks you're amazing. God loves you so very, very much. You're, you're his beloved. You know, when you think about the Muslim faith, which has become such a big deal today, you know, Muslims spend their entire life hoping, hoping that they will do something worthy of God saying in that day, well, you'll do. And that is not a God of love, but it's a God of religion. And often, friends, we bring that kind of picture into the church. And that's not who God is. He's so wonderful. They don't have a relationship. They have this this kind of servitude. But we can have confidence because God is so faithful. You know, in in Philippians chapter 1, I am confident of this very thing, that he began a good work in you, will perfect it till the day of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I have to finish because of time, but... I was going to say a bunch of other things, but it's so important that the way the Father is represented to the church. You know, and I believe, you know, in fact, this scripture in Matthew, it says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who belong to me to stumble, it would be better for a large millstone, (coughs) excuse me, to be hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, we often think that's children, and it probably is children, but I do believe that if anyone causes these little ones to be led astray. 
And it's often a, a bad example or it's actually lead them into a, a poor place or a, poor, a place where their, their whole faith is being, being undermined by a valueless thing. And today I believe God wants you to know he loves you. I'm going to show you a very quick video and then I'm just going to do something to finish today quickly. Thank you guys if you could do that please. to play. That's it. Here he comes. Well, all right. Now it's time for me to tell you all what you've done wrong since I last saw you. And don't try and hide because I'm Jesus. I will find you. Let's start with you, Peter. You lied to your mother the other day. Andrew, you said a naughty word when you hit your finger with the hammer. James, you laughed at him when he hit his finger. Moving right along, John, you drank too much wine the other night. Not way too much, just enough to make me angry. Matthew, we fell asleep in church, didn't we? Yes, we did. And Thomas, you were slow dancing a little too close with that girlfriend of yours. Let's see, and you, I forgot your name, so you're off the hook for now. Um, hmm. Philip, I saw you smoking a cigarette behind that big rock the other day. Thaddeus, I hate to say I saw you stick up your middle finger at someone who cut you off when you were riding your camel. Benjamin, you aren't wearing your WWJD bracelet. Jacob, I don't mind you saying my name, but not after you stub your toe. Um, Frank, you know what you did. I just can't repeat it because I'm Jesus. All right, all you sinners, come with me. It's time to pay the piper. Man, it was only one cigarette. I heard that. Look at all these sinners. All right, listen up. Listen to me. I'm Jesus. Listen to what I have to say. I have done many wonderful things. I have healed many people of diseases. I have performed many miracles so that I can tell you this. You're all evil. There is no hope. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, if that's the Jesus that you're following, then you have a problem. And you know, that, that was kind of funny, but, but the truth is many of us go from a place of thinking he's disapproving of me, he's angry with me, who knows what I'm talking about. You know, I've sinned and so God's not talking to me today or, or I'm not talking to him because I've done something wrong. And, and we live this life and, and truly, friends, that's not what faith is about. I want you to um, close your eyes right across the room. Please, everyone, close your eyes. The Eternal is my shepherd. He cares for me always. He provides me rest in rich green fields. Besides streams of refreshing water, he soothes my fears. He makes me whole again, steering me off worn, hard paths to roads where truth and righteousness echo his name. Even in the unending shadows of death's darkness, I am not overcome by fear. Because you are with me in those dark moments, near me with your protection and guidance, I am comforted. You spread out a table before me, provisions in the midst of attack from my enemy. You care for all my needs, anointing my head with soothing, fragrant oil, filling my cup again and again with your grace. Certainly, your faithful protection and loving provision will pursue me wherever I go, always, everywhere. I will always be with the Eternal 
in your house forever. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you this morning that we can know you. Not as a judge in our hearts, but someone who cares for us. Someone who's promised to be with us. And this morning, Lord, as we thank you, and right across the room, I just want you to recommit to that place of knowing him as a father. Knowing him as not a judge, not as someone who disapproves of what you do, but knowing him as a, a father who cares for you. Even if you've had a bad example or no example like me, you can know him. You can love him. You can be in relationship with him. And this morning, I want you just to, in a few moments, as we just listen to this music, I want you to just say, Jesus, I recommit my relationship to you. I pray that from this time on, 2015, I would be truly, truly walking as a son. In Jesus' name. bless the Lord you know this morning we're going to finish now but I just would encourage you if you don't like some prayer we have some people that would pray with you but perhaps you're in this place and you feel like hey you know I just really need to confirm that I've recommitted my heart this day to a place of of reconsecration maybe you need to respond by coming forward and someone can pray with you you know, I want you to go out of this place with a new desire, a new longing in your heart to, to let God be who He is, who He's supposed to be in your heart and in your life. He's so trustworthy. He's so trustworthy. He dreams for you. He loves you. This is not conditional love, but He loves you. Amen. Bless the Lord. Why don't we all stand? Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for your goodness to us and your grace and your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that this is the day that the Lord has made. And we can rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And, Lord, I rededicate myself to to being all the best I can be for you. And I accept your grace and your love and your mercy that would follow me all the days of my life. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you this morning. Please give someone a, a God bless you as you leave today. If you'd like some prayer, we'd love to pray with you. Give you a hug on the way out.